Um, with your permission, I will just go a little bit fast over the slides because there is no time. But I think it is important to show the slides. Um, so I'm going to do that. How do you move that? Yes. Right. Well, first of all, gracias. Thank you, Raquel. Gracias, Ned. Thank you. And thank you, Viviana. Um, th thanks to all of you for sharing this very interesting topic. The only way that we're going to make progress on this issue, which is so serious, is like this, what we're doing right here. So it's very important what Ned is doing here. Thanks again. So uh, the question is just to start the presentation quickly, why the pers persistence of the gender gap? And I put there that Columbia University is a solid proven example, and I'm not going to comment on that, but you know, we can answer questions later. And there is the World Economic Forum produced a useful record of a gender gap index, which you see here. I'm not going to go into the statistical details, but it is very useful to see it recognized at that level. And it is going up. It is going up. So we as economists know that markets should equate wages. So markets and rational economic behavior are expected to equate salaries, but they don't work in this case. The gap is going up. There is like a cognitive dissonance. It's a puzzling disconnect. And it's sufficiently puzzling that leads to some public statements um, about genetical inferiority of women, which makes the problem worse. Even particularly in university. I'm referring to, um, to Larry Summers, of course. Uh, his his uh, public statements about the issue. So what, what I'll do here is provide a market explanation of the gender gap based on the rational economic interaction between two separate but interlinked institutions, which are the market and the family. Actually, we heard some of that from the previous presentation. These two elements are there. There are externalities between the two institutions. Inequity at work leads to inequity at home. It is a natural response to use more women at home when the opportunity cost of men in the marketplace will be higher. Reciprocally, inequity at home, the disproportional use of women for producing family services, leads to inequity in the marketplace. And we heard it from the previous presentations. Now, these two type of externalities of one institution and the other, and the uh, interaction between them is similar to the prisoner's dilemma in terms of the solutions that emerge. And that so-called uh, prisoner dilemma solution is the gender gap. And it's very persistent, as it is the prisoner's dilemma. So the bottom line is that the gender gap is a prisoner's dilemma. And the issue is uh, rational or not rational is as much as the prisoner's dilemma is a rational phenomenon or an irrational phenomenon. But we say rational once we consider uh, the Nash equilibrium of the game. I don't have time to go over this, but I wanted you to see that this is all solidly grounded in economics. So the economics of the market and the economics of the family are that women and men produce skilled labor and firms use skilled labor to produce market goods. Families produce home services using as input time, 24 hours a day, or, and 
The key is that women divide their time between the 24 hours, between market and the home. Mm. So firms maximize profits. They are competitive uh, firms that maximize profits, and families maximize welfare. The time which is working at home lowers the amount of productivity at, in the market, and the productivity parameter measures work at home and represents an externality that it imposes on the firm. Both genders have here the similar, similar capabilities, and yet you will see the gender, gender gap emerge. Um, the, hmm. So how does it happen? What's the objective of the market? To maximize profits. The family's objective is to maximize welfare. The market strategy is to set wages for men and for women, and the family strategy is to allocate labor at home among men and women, L1 and L2. I want, I want to move this, yeah. So this is really a classic, truly classic problem. The classic problem is how to allocate two resources efficiently between two competing activities. Remember that there are two types of institutions. One is maximizing profits, the other one is producing a public good, which is a family service, and maximizing welfare. So the new findings I'm going to refer to quickly, and of course I don't have time, is that the division of labor, which division of labor? This, the classic, is one of the most classic problems in economics how to allocate two resources efficiently between two competitive activities. It's just a classic problem of allocating resources between competing activities. So in terms of findings, this for some reason wasn't done before. That division of labor, the solution, depends on the shape of the learning by doing curve. How the human brain acquires and perfects skills. The learning by doing curve is well known in psychology, was introduced in economics by Kenneth Arrow, I believe. And the more time we work on an activity, the more productive we become. And that leads to concave curve. If you have convexity, you have the case that Becker studied. And Becker showed that specialization is efficient. So Becker's learning by doing leads to specialization. Some specialize working at home, some specialize in the marketplace. And if women's salaries are lower than men's, it's efficient that women do more ho homework, housework, and men work more in the marketplace. That's Becker, we know that. But this does not explain why women are entering the labor force in ever increasing numbers, and why are we here? Now, the learning by doing curve that I'm going to talk about was not considered by Becker, who looked at the concave case. Uh, sorry, yeah, the convex case. Learning by doing comes from experimental psychology. The, the statement is that the time needs to execute the task decreases exponentially with the number of trials, and there is an asymptotic limit. Here you have the learning by doing curve in all its uh, uh, regal geometry, and the logistic curve is presented down there. But what I told you before suffices to explain why it looks like that. Now, how do you go from experimental psychology to economics? Simple. You identify time with the number of trials, and you identify output per unit of time with the inverse of the time of execution, which leads to that logistic curve, which is what you just saw here, this curve. The vertical is productivity, the horizontal is time. There is an important regime switch there, which more or less says at lower levels of productivity, uh, you are in Becker's regime. At higher level, you are in a, a 
concave regime and you are in what I would call Arrow's regime. I am uh, quickly saying that Arrow did not identify himself with that regime, but his results did. So there is a regime shift, which is validated everywhere in experimental psychology. After a number of trials, the curve turns from convex to concave, and I say from Becker shape to arrow shape. What has not been observed is that this shifts the results. It, the optimal division of labor depends on the shape, and there is a regime sw switch that I, mo I uh, showed you, and in the lower parts, with lower scale, you are in Becker specialization mode, and that's the efficient thing to do. At higher, higher level of skill, that's inefficient. So the bottom line of putting these things together is that the gender gap is a prisoner's dilemma. We are all prisoners of the gender gap. The family market game is similar to the prisoner dilemma when the two players are symmetrically situated and when both rationally choose the worst strategy rather than the strategy which is better for both. So are we all crazy? Not quite. But the, the Nash equilibrium that gives rise to the uh, prisoner's dilemma is an, if, it is an inferior solution. The equity solution is superior. And the prisoner's dilemma doesn't dismiss its efficiency, its um, rationality because of the inefficiency. So this is what has to be understood. We are prisoners in reality of this dilemma. This uh, matrix is supposed to explain everything. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> well. You're complaining about that. <laughs> but now let me tell you what the theorems are. So the first theorem is the division of labor. And it says um, when the total amount of effort allocated to a sector is below the inflection point, the switching point, Pareto efficiency requires specialization. And that's what Becker said, and he's right. But when the average effort allocated, and therefore the skill, exceeds that switching point, Pareto efficiency requires equal division of labor within each of the two sectors, and equal compensation. So this is what's not understood. We are accumulating skill. We are in the knowledge revolution. And we are moving and switching, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> switching regimes. <coughs> So we are switching regimes because of the way the human brain learns by doing. And we are moving into the higher levels of skill where equity benefits the family. And yet we are stuck intellectually in the Becker specialization and in the, uh, um, in the prisoner's dilemma. So we're situated here between the two. And that is what's happening. We are not irrational. The switching is taking place. The amount of skill accumulating is enormous, both individually and for society as a whole. The productivity, for example, in the US is you know, skyrocketed. And yet, we don't react to that because the two institutions are engaged in this game, in this uh, non-cooperative game. The consequence of inequity at home is to lead to lower productivity of women at work and to lower salaries of women. We heard it. We heard it in the previous presentation. This is a rational, but it's an inferior response. It's a prisoner dilemma response. Yet the concept of equity is that a higher level of out output and skill, the equity both will benefit the family and it will benefit the, the workplace. And in the workplace, equity increases the firm's outputs and profits. And 
in the family, it increases family services, the amount of family services, and the family's consumption of market goods. So it's, it's a Pareto superior solution, equity. So you say, why is it not happening? Go remember why the prisoner dilemma is so attractive and so powerful and it keeps us prisoner. But we are in the middle of those two. The conclusion is that the coupling, the economic coupling of the market and the family leads to a persistent inequality or gender gap, which is the prisoner's dilemma. Where the disproportionate allocation of home responsibilities go to women and simultaneously leads to lower women wages. The gender gap is an inferior Nash equilibrium. It arises from externalities between the family and the marketplace. The family loses if it plays fair when the market doesn't, and vice versa. I'm happy to explain that. Maybe I will say that very quickly. If you hire somebody that ex expecting that the family plays fair, and you invest a lot of money, I know I'm a CEO in a company, and I know how much it takes to train somebody and hopefully to bring them to the level of productivity you need. And if after that it turns out the person will take leave or will be unable to work because of conditions at home, well, that's a blow for the marketplace. So I may want to play fair and unfair in the sense of, you know, um, balance the presumed risky situation. The same thing happens for the family if the family uh, sends the woman out to the marketplace, expecting that the marketplace will be fair, and it turns out that if they would have sent the man, the income coming from the market to the family would have been much higher than was needed, that's a blow. So now we are you know, understanding that there is a problem. The problem is, is rational. It's a rational situation. It's just a non-cooperative equilibrium between two institutions. But the question is, what's the solution? So the inequality in the private sphere is typically rooted in family or customary laws and gender-based discrimination in civil codes. So what's needed is equal citizenship rights, right to work, equal work and retirement benefit, very important, equal rights to transfer retirement benefits, equal rights on child custody, freedom to travel, and all of these are lacking in many nations of the, of the world today. In fact, in the United States, we don't have the Equal Pay Act. I know it's astounding, but it's true. In industrial economies, they need family, we need family market contracts. I know this sounds unusual. I'm, I'm out, I'm out of town, time. So, uh, these are the type of institutions, thank you. These are the type of institutions that are needed and uh, family laws such as no-fault divorce and equal say and power between the partners and about equal rights on communal pr property, prenuptial agreements that specify women and men's role in the family, penalties of the parties if a party see the party defaults, such as bonds, and laws prohibiting discrimination in the workplace on the basis of gender, race, equal pay act, etc., and so that the fair employee is not misled. So industrial economies needs market policies, equal pay provision, supporting the execution of prenuptial agreements, equal rights of husband and wife, and firms should not risk being penalized for playing. Okay, over did it too much. Okay. <laughs>